Hi, I'm Heather Hilda Darling on Let's Talk Property today on Radio Reverb 97.2 FM and DAB. So let's get moving. That sounds quite appropriate, doesn't it? If you've moved as many times as I have in my lifetime, you think I'd be familiar with all the ins and outs and questions that buyers and sellers ask. Actually, it becomes a little bit over familiar to me sometimes and you do forget to ask those little questions that mean a lot. And actually, as estate agents, we have to use our ears an awful lot rather than doing all the talking. We do hear so much about first-time buyers, especially in the news recently, but what about first-time sellers? Are they the forgotten crowd? The first-time sellers are those that I would judge have never sold a property before, or maybe it was so long ago that they've forgotten what it was like in the olden days, and they may be unaware as to how legislation and the systems have changed. And of course, recently in the news and with the stamp duty land tax deadline ending on the 30th of June, that affects buyers who are moving into a property over the um, allocated price ranges and sellers as well. As media headlines claim rising average prices for property, how daunting is moving after many years? Today on Let's Talk Property, I'm joined by Josh Sharples. Now, Josh is the station producer of Radio Reverb, so I'm going to have to be on my best behaviour. <laughs> and James Duffy, the compliance guru of Callaway's Residential Sales and Lettings. James is also the Sussex representative of Arla Property Mark. So lovely for you to be joining me today. Thank you, Josh, for joining us and James as well. Well, hello, Heather. Hello, hello. 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 are yeah. you both feeling comfortable? Yes, as comfortable as can be. <laughs> <laughs> we're still not That's in the studio, are we? So we're relying on yes. good old Zoom, but hopefully soon enough we'll be there. Now, I want to just put you both on the property spot to start with. And uh, James, this might be a bit simpler for you because obviously you work in estate agency. Oh. So could you just give me maybe three questions that you can think of when it comes to just imagine you're selling your property property what would you ask of your agent i would first question i would ask them would be um their experience of selling similar properties in to, in in the local area to where my property is i would ask them second question would be how they could assist me finding my next property the third question would be if they are part of any regulatory body and uh, if they are qualified I like those answers, James, but Josh, did you ask yourself any of those questions when you came to appoint your agent? I did actually, yeah. I think um, you have to ask those questions to to, um, to make you go forward, I think, to, um, yeah, um, thinking about how much, how long will it take is was a big question for me, actually, um, and um, the process behind, behind it. Um, you know, I, I, I sold my place 20 years, I, I bought this place 20 years ago, so um, I, think, I think it's changed a lot in those 20 years, I, I presume. Well, were you shocked about the changes? No, I, I think because I, were, I was thinking back to, to when I um, bought the place, I was helped by my mum, my which was amazing. She, she helped me with the deposit. And also, the, my partner at the time, he, his niece, I think it is, um, she was a solicitor. So, so we kind of got a bit of help in that. So it was a bit easier than, than, than I expect. And I kind of just, it kind of fell into place quite quickly, quite easily. So you were sort of a pale green rather than totally green when you moved into it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Were there any particular questions that you wished you'd asked before you put it on the market? Do you mean my property now? Yes. I, th I think that my stage agent actually answered quite a lot of the questions, really. I think the thing for me is I th what James said was about the, um, can you help me find the, the next property? I think that's very important for me at the moment. That, that is what's come up for me since, because I've gone under offer so quite quickly, I think. And um, so the, the doubt and the, oh, my God, and that, where am I going to go? It's kind of that, that, and that's what's kind of ruling me at the moment a little bit, to be honest. There's a lot going on in your head all the time, isn't there? 
Yeah, sleep. I've had. I've kind of dozed off on the sofa and got up and dragged myself to the bed to bed, and then I can't sleep because I'm thinking about. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So, Josh, just to introduce yourself, thank you for those couple of questions. I hope I did put you on the spot a you little did. bit. <laughs> uh, so, you work as station producer for Radio Reverb. Yes. Uh, that must be very different to buying and selling property, or is it? I don't know actually well, that's a good one Heather I think because um, I'm, I'm new in the role of that as well I, I got the job um, just over a year ago so and I, again that's something new that I've never done before so I, obviously I'm, I've been into music and things like that but never had to help run a, a, a full a radio a station so there's things that you have to be kind of um, on the ball with and precise and like scheduling. So it's all kind of similar. There's it's still of... a very people business, though, isn't it? Yes, yes. What absolutely. you do, you're you're helping people, you're guiding yeah. people, and I think James, isn't that something that we do as agents? Yes, and I think mm. um, it, it does. Every seller is at a different stage in their process and experience I mean you know Josh bought his property that he's now selling 20 years ago even though things have changed his experience of buying is will be completely different to what the experience would be for selling so but they are completely different worries that you have and and apprehensions and skills that you need so it is or it is a people business it's about really um, understanding both sides of the transaction to understand that the end goal is achieved because if you if, if you don't listen and understand and also from a seller's perspective sellers really do need to uh, be honest with the estate agent they want to instruct to to be clear on what their end goal is because if you don't really explain that at the beginning you may get the wrong advice or you might end up engaging the wrong estate agent who hasn't got the right skills to help you so I think what people forget to do sometimes I think a lot of people in the industry see it as a people business I do sometimes worry that the consumers whether that be the buyers or the sellers see it very much as a transactional situation and maybe that some state agents historically have been after just chasing the deal but that has changed over a number of years now because to actually get a deal a transaction through you really do need to do a lot more than just put a property on on one of the portals so fundamentally it is a people business yeah with the radio I suppose you've got the listeners and you've got the producers and the presenters so it's trying to keep that um, balance, isn't it, of, of, of making good radio and, and listening to both sides, which is, which is similar, isn't it? Well, it's that two ears and one mouth thing again, isn't it, yeah, really? Yeah. And I think sometimes maybe agents can be accused of not listening. And I know James and I have had this conversation before that people say, I want a three bedroom property with a garden and then they might buy something completely different. But you've got to start somewhere because the, the start is not necessarily the end result either. Would that be yeah. correct, James? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think when you initially start looking, I mean, you know, Josh, you've touched on it. You're sitting thinking, oh, what about my next purchase? The, the best advice I can give is just keep your options reasonably wide and open. Um, and over time, you'll then definitely come across something and it'll narrow down. But if you become too strict on your search at the very early stage, you could miss some a real good opportunity that's just slightly outside of your criteria and you think, oh, I never thought of that. And that's where it comes down to. I think the internet's been a brilliant thing for property searching, but I think a lot of people have relied on setting themselves up to get alerts from the portals and not then engaging with the professionals on the ground. And the best advice I can give anyone specifically in this market when there is a real shortage of uh, quality property, that unless you're going to have that proper engagement with a local or a couple of local decent agents where you're looking to buy, you may not pick up on these potential properties that don't quite fit your criteria, but they go, have you thought about X or have you thought about Y? I've got this one coming on. Those alerts can't offer you that bit of advice. And that's yeah. that's a little bit of a tip from me. <laughs> no, <it's good. laughs> no. <laughs> we often hear that moving house is very, very stressful on the Richter scale. So, Josh, <laughs> I'm going to ask you, you may not be able to answer with one number. Um, I mean, obviously, you've got all the stages that you go through the am I going to put it on the market now? Is now the right market? Right, I'm going to choose an agent. Right, we're going to put it on the market. Right, the viewings are happening. <laughs> 
your experience from when you first decided to now you've got your property under offer and subject to contract, how have the emotions played in your mind? You've already said you can't sleep. What's yeah. been going on? So, yeah, I would say, I mean, on the, on the Richter scale, on the, Richter scale, <laughs> but on the yeah. scale, um, I'm a, I swear between five and seven on that thing, so it's quite stressful. And then sometimes I can... The thing that really helps is talking to my estate agent and talking to friends, talking to people who've been in that same similar situation, and they they can they can help because your mind can can create things that are actually aren't there, and they can they can they, you can build upon the fear, and the fear becomes like oh my god I can't this is too much, and then and then if you talk to somebody else and and get that support they can actually you can see it in a different way and um, it calms you down a bit. So and, and and actually like last night was one of those nights that I just for, for just for about half an hour I just couldn't sleep I was going round and round. So then I woke up this morning and I felt clear. And so it's like it is. It's like a roller coaster. It's a wa- wave. Sometimes I'm really, really sort of with it. I know exactly what I'm going to do. This is absolutely right. <laughs> Uh, and then other times I'm thinking, oh my God, what the hell? What, 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 what? what am I doing? Yes. Yeah. But, but actually, I've been thinking about it a lot today and I, um, I know it's the right thing to do. Like, I, I, I'm the kind of person that won't, won't, if, if it's not the right thing to do, then I, I'll be constantly trying to find somewhere to stop doing it. But I know this is the right thing for me to do it for me. So. Um, it's very weird how nighttime is the time when our fears and all our mm. sort of unconscious, oh my goodness, what am I doing, come to the fore. James, have you found that that's something that people experience as buyers and sellers a lot? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we can underestimate the amount of things that need to be considered when you're not just selling, but also want to tie in a purchase. It's not just worrying about all the elements of getting the property sold but then you've got to worry about trying to find somewhere but if you're also changing area even just slightly you know you then it's all the other bits that you've got to consider might be work it might be doctors it might be schools it depends what the client is so all these things just keep racing around people's mind and there's so much to consider Uh, on top of that they're anxious about whether they're even going to find the property that they like so it is very very common and I think the the only advice you know that you can really give to clients is you just got to take it I know it's easier said than done because obviously we've all most of us have moved even if you've been moving for renting it's not it's not such a commitment but it still gives you anxiety if you're not careful but you've got to focus on getting the best buy for your property making sure the property is as sellable as possible once you've got that as as clear as you can make it then you've got the foundations to then go out and find something um and buyers have to be patient or you could choose to break the chain but obviously that's another consideration you think or think where you're going to go in the interim so because there are quite a few considerations along the way people just it makes it more difficult for people um so you just got to do you've got to try as much as possible as, as, as take one thing at a time and um Josh makes a good point. Talk to people that are are, are our friends or family that have gone through it, or, or and also if you've engaged a good quality estate agent, they should be experienced enough to help you help you diffuse the things that seem a big thing, but they're not really because we do it all day long, and we can say, well, it might look a big thing to you, but actually this can be easily resolved. You know, don't don't worry. So, Radio River. Do you think we make enough of the emotional side of buying and selling? Probably not, actually. I think I think um, it's a really important part of, of the move, isn't it? So it's a process, isn't it? So you are moving house, and I, I know that for a fact, that, isn't it, that, that it's one of the most stressful things that you can do. So I think to have to know that there's a, some support there from whoever you, you you want it from is is a really important thing, and it's. It's probably underplayed, to be honest. Well, we all do it. We all know it's yeah. the most one of the most stressful things. But you think how many people are moving, <laughs> you know, day in, day out, week yeah. after week, month after month. We all do it. But I think that's because we've got another goal in mind. Maybe we want to get a, a better work-life balance or maybe we just want new opportunities where we're moving to. Maybe we want more green space, you know, and all that sort of comes into play as well and and fear is such
such a dreadful thing. It can hold us back for so many reasons Mm. when actually, and I think you're right, you know, talking to friends and family and your agent who says, well, no, this is normal. Don't worry about it. Everybody goes through. I mean, we have enough stressful moments in the office as well, James. Let's be said, you know, I mean, (laughs) when exchange days are coming up and, you know, completion days and you just sort of think, well, you know, we just got to deal with it. It is a process and you deal with the process. Now, this might be a little bit too early to ask you, Joss, but do you see yourself moving again in the future or is this your last move? Maybe my last move, I think, at the moment. I think <laughs> what you were saying earlier just then, Heather, about why I'm moving. I, th- I think I've been, um, I live in Central Hove, so it's quite a um, busy place and it's been a fantastic place. It's great. But I'm, I'm, I'm coming up to being 52 uh, and... I just want something different. I want. I've changed a lot, and I think I, I don't want. I want to live in a different kind of space, with a bit more space for myself, really. And that's the reason. So, I think um, a lot of people have come to that over the past yeah. sort of eighteen months. We're all reassessing what we really want out of life. Do we want to keep on this hamster wheel, rushing around and everything? And yet, so many people have found pleasure in the small things like going for walks having a pet doing the gardening growing vegetables growing plants and do you think this is a very human response to all this stress that we've had actually you've been ad- you've added more stress to your life really haven't you Josh by moving yeah. but <laughs> what, what, do, what do you think generally do you think this is just a natural reaction to the last 18 months yeah I was going to say about COVID because I think COVID with it's a very un- it's been a very unsettling time hasn't it for everyone so um to have some kind of um distraction or some familiarity like a pet or going for a walk and just clear your head i know like i've had days where i just you know we've not been asked we've been asked not to leave the flat for a week so and then so you just again you're in your head again so so by going out and just doing those small things going to, into the garden and it just clears your head and you, and, and you can and you can think clearer, I think, and it helps. But we are very lucky, aren't we, in Central Hove, a short walk down yeah. to the beach, another perhaps short drive up to the Downs. We've got lots of parks in Hove. It is a wonderful place to live. But sometimes you're still looking for that little extra special something that might pull you further away. James, you've lived in several places, haven't you? I mean, do you get stressed? On the one hand, you're an agent. On the other hand, you're an ordinary human being. <laughs> How does it affect estate agents? when they move well we have the same the same issues because obviously we've still got to balance all of our personal circumstances around trying to move and also I also have inside knowledge that you know of maybe what really can go wrong I think the overriding worry that I would have as a professional is all day long I, I try to reassure our clients that it will be okay and take it one step at a time but I think the fundamental worry for a professional is nothing is certain that's one of the problems with the transactions in in the uk is that no one is committed until the exchange and um that's that's one thing that as someone buying but also as a professional i'm very aware that it doesn't matter how much you can calm yourself down at any stage the seller the buyer or the chain of people you could be in a chain of five or six people there's only got to be have one person to to lose their confidence or lose their job or decide that they've made the wrong decision and the whole thing potentially collapses so that is something that you you cannot tell anyone it'd be okay that is just the system but um when i've moved or when i bought i have applied the same I, do, I really do do my research on on the agent that i want to sell through and sometimes actually i've done my research on the agent that i've seen a property through i know that sounds a bit uh hard to manage that because you the, the agents either got the property or they haven't but um I, I do find myself doing a bit of background checking because then i think to myself well i'm going to need to if, if, for example if, if they're not obviously specialists in that area and they seem to have a property which is not something they would normally carry on their stock or they're not members of property mark for whatever reason i i then think to myself well maybe i need to knowing what i know about the industry uh, be a little bit more forceful with due diligence and ask more questions about the property than maybe what they are uh being 
transparent about. But specifically, when I've come to sell, I would say that I put a lot of emphasis on the quality of the person that I'm going to be dealing with because it is okay, we all want the best price and we all want to pay the most competitive fee. But I know that I need to be able to call that ad state agent that I'm selling through and lean on them and really trust that they're going to give the correct information back to me about the, about the chain. It's one of the questions I actually ask is okay brilliant you've come out to present to me and i've actually built up a good rapport with you and i've and, and i actually do trust you to sell my property but once i put it on the market will i be dealing with you or are you passing me on to another colleague um and that will depend on the size of the organization or the the agent you want to sell through and that's quite an important question because you as a seller could think that you're going to have the whole transaction with that person but actually they might just all day long go out and value houses and don't deal with any views or don't do with any offers or don't do with any of the conveyancing process and actually you may not talk to that person potentially again potentially depending on the depends on the size of the firm and if they answer that question and say well no you, you won't be dealing with me you then need to say well who will i be dealing with and can I meet those can I meet the team um so they're the things that I would go a bit deeper on myself because mm -hmm. I put quite a bit of emphasis on the building of the relationship because it could be a four-month transaction that I've got to be able to really engage with those people exactly I mm -hmm. think this is really why having somebody on the end of a phone I mean at the moment there's so much prop tech as we call it you know all the technical systems that go on in property um, and I think we would like to see prop tech making the system from start to finish quicker but you still have to have a process in there and you still need to do the checks and balances at the moment so do, do you think that any other prop tech would have made what you've been doing putting your property on the market simpler Josh or have you been happy so far with the way it's been carried out i've actually been happy with the way it's carried out actually mm -hmm. I, i'm yeah i think it's it's been yeah i think i think the, the emails that come through all the time and you know exactly i think for me it's it's it's, it's knowing what what to do and 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 knowing what to do in the right time order mm. in the right order yeah and to mm. but also not to give yourself such a hard time about oh got, got to do that and push yourself and so that's more what i'm kind of bit, the, the the process of the all the tech stuff i think is 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 okay with me i think I mean, oh okay fine yeah so this is really a question for both of you um james i'll start with you first because i know you're very very keen to educate you know the public about what buying is all about what selling is all about the processes are estate agents sometimes guilty of not sharing with their clients what's going on behind the scenes? Uh, I think there's a, 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 a fine line there between, say, not sharing and, and, and managing the process because we've all already we hear from lots of sellers that it can be very stressful the transaction and and we're the professionals in this in this transaction and. We have to not hold back information. That would be completely wrong. But we need to manage uh, how that information is is communicated and, and actually confirm it's actually correct. Because sometimes you can get misinformation up the chain. And uh, I think what sometimes the industry is guilty of is not telling people all what is involved in the transaction, so that people understand. You know, actually, it, it's it's quite a big it's quite a big job to do. Um, one of the things I think the industry and the prop tech area should probably um, look at, and I'm sure there's things in development, is that once a transaction is almost sealed, if you like, and all the people in the chain are you know, identifiable, then they have some way of all logging into a secure uh, technical app that gives them some transparency about how the chain is progressing. So they don't have to rely on uh, maybe mixed messages or, or incorrect information. It, it's very, it's very um, transparent, but it would rely on the right tech and it would rely on the people, you know, updating that correctly. But I think that would give some reassurance to people uh, in their transaction that they can see where the where things are being held up and maybe where it's going going very well without having to always rely on um, whether they believe they're getting the right message. But mm. um, I think there's an there's an element of what you have to try and manage to to to, to not freak people out, but also they they have to they have you have to be honest and transparent. 
Josh, what would your opinion be on how educative we are, or educative is probably the right word, on what's going on, what's happening next? Because if I think if you give people too much information to start with, they just get confused. It, and you said it's like a process, and obviously each process has a step-by-step you know, way yeah. of moving forward. Is that the way that you felt you've been handled or do you want to know the steps a little bit further ahead? No, I, th- I think um, a very slow step-by-step. Step-by-step. Is, for, for me, yeah, that's better because otherwise you can be bombarded. And it could, again, that creates fear again, doesn't it? And, and, yes. And doubt. And, and yeah, because I think for me, I, I know when I'm going to do something and um, I can... It feels like I'm procrastinating over it, but actually what's happening is I, I don't need to do it to, to, yet. Yeah. But it feels like I'm procrastinating. I'm yeah. like, oh my God, I've got to do that. But actually when I'm ready to do it and it needs to be done, I, I, me as a person will do that and do it. And mm. so the process has been, um, I've, had, I've had it as it comes along and it's felt the right time. Yeah, the right time. And, um, but now, now I'm start, because I've got this about moving and not knowing what I'm going to do, that is just playing on my mind at the back of my mind. So I'm trying to just hold on to the fact that this is what I'm doing now. But this this voice in my head is saying, you've got to find some way. And, and what are you going to do? Are you going to rent? Are you going to move? What are you going to do with your staff? And so it's all, yeah. So having a step-by-step, what I say is having a step-by-step um, thing is, is better because 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 you'll have those other nagging voices in your head mm-hmm. that makes sense i'm not making sense okay. yeah. yeah um is there anything that you've been surprised about what agents do that you didn't actually know josh from the outset i mean obviously we can't go through everything that we we do as agents and many other agents but is there any area that you think oh i wish they did that or Maybe they do, but it's not been communicated properly. Um, or something that's just happened in the past few weeks that you thought, oh, I didn't know they did that. I've, I've liked the fact that, you know, you can't get to know your, the people who are interested. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but um, I, I quite, I, for me, I'm a, I'm a, pers- uh, I'm a um, person person. And I kind of like to know who, who's going to, who's interested in the property. And I've kind of gone for that kind of, human side aspect mm-hmm. of who I chose to um mm-hmm. who I wanted to give the offer to so right. that was a really that's a really good um aspect so I don't know if I've answered your question there Heather um, <laughs> I think that's fine no, I, think, I, I, I think we understand and actually that is the human side of estate yes. agency isn't yeah. it you know and and as I said at the outset above and beyond everything else I think if you're a people person those are the aspects of estate agency that you enjoy you know we don't go we, we go out to engage with people as well as do a transaction because well I think I've said I've moved loads of times and I just know how difficult it can be but to trust your agent to be to, to be sat perhaps sometimes on the end of the phone going oh should I call him or shouldn't I and you think no he's my agent I'm going to call yes. him it doesn't matter how many times a day that's what you should be there for and I think you should I think you should feel and you should feel that that's okay to do that yeah and not to feel, not to worry that oh I shouldn't be calling them, but because mm-hmm. that's that's the responsibility. I, I will say though, um, I was thinking about me going to look at properties, just saying what I saw the um, the estate agent um, t- telling me who these people were, a little bit about them, not everything. Um, I went to see some properties and I didn't get that information. I didn't feel I got a sense of it was get me in, get, look around the property and get me out. So, uh, there was not much conversation so it is a good just for that personal touch I think and I think the other thing is when you first bought your property that you're in at the moment you bought it for a reason and I suppose we're all looking for people that we sort of click with or just tick along with sometimes and you know well why did you buy your property because it's got a b c therefore the people that are going to buy your property are probably very very similar to you yourself yeah, well, it's interesting because I got I, I bought this my property from um, uh, it was I, I was a barber so and I got I was just talking about that I was looking for somewhere to live and um, the client said oh I know someone who's who's selling and that's how that started. <laughs> 
it just, and that's it. And I've been here for twenty years. So well. it's, it's, it's strange, isn't it? And you've probably done well. a lot of cut since then. Who, who need property <laughs> portals when you've got that, that memory exactly. resources? Exactly. Well, I think yeah. this is it. People In forget. People forget that you know if you talk to people, they very often come up with some. Oh, I know somebody who's selling. Oh, I know somebody who's thinking I'll have, about. I'll it. have to give you some of my cards, Josh. When you're chatting, <laughs> chatting. Absolutely. Um, so I'm just really curious. You know, sometimes people decide to sell their property themselves without an agent. How would that make you feel, Josh? <laughs> Which is the client to say it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no go, is it? A no yeah. go. I think so. I think I prefer a professional to to do it. Actually, yeah. I, th- I think um, I, I did. I mean. I did think about it, but for about a millisecond. <laughs> <laughs> so your friends talked you out of it, did they? <laughs> no, a friend. I think I, I know somebody who did do it themselves, and um, they were all right with it. But um, I think it depends on what kind of person you are. I think. Yeah. I think for me, I just prefer to just pass it on and let let the professionals do it. And... Mm. Okay. So just talking about your property, when you were thinking about putting it on the on the market and you're sort of on high alert about, you know, what are they going to be look, looking for? What did you feel was the most attractive feature of your property? It was the garden. The garden. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, actually, location as well. Actually, it's the location as well. Mm-hmm. And did you have any idea how agents worked out what your property was worth? Had you done your own research or anything like that? I kind of. I've looked at other properties similar to mine in my area. Um, I hadn't done much research, to be honest. But um, I, 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 I think because the, the market is so... Um, because of the stamp duty, and, and uh, it's very competitive, isn't it, with um people I, I didn't really i didn't know what i'd get actually i knew, i had a figure in my mind and um and yeah so um i was kind of yeah i was a bit unsure about what mm. what i would get to be honest mm. um but i kind of knew what other um prices for the flats have gone for in my area now, James is a great advocate for preparing documentation before you put your property on the market. Isn't that right, James? I am. And that's purely to save everyone's heartache at the end when they realise they haven't got it and they can't move. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did that work out with you, Josh? Having the documentation? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have that kind of stuff. I think it's, um, I've got a little thing in my email with, with selling house. So I put all my documentation into there keeping it in one place and um yeah so yeah it's it's good to have all that i think i think i'm 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 one for just having things everywhere else but i've realized i think selling a house is really important you need to have it where you can get it at it it, yeah (laughs) because if you want if anyone needs anything then you know where it is exactly were you aware of all the the sort of the procedures for viewings during lockdown and and how did you feel about strangers coming into your home i mean admittedly i think it was a little bit sort of when the rules were relaxed but Mm. how, how did that make you feel i was a bit no i was okay with it i think um as long as I think my agent, agents um, were uh, prepared with all what they had to do about um, masks and stuff, so and all the people who came to see uh, my, my flat were uh, prepared and uh, knew exactly what what was uh, what they had to do. So um, I'm okay with that. I was I was fine with it. So, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Now, when you got your feedback after your viewings, did it feel very personal? Because I know that some sellers prefer not to hear, because it's your home after all. I know you may be selling it, but it's your home. You've been there for a long time and it can feel very personal. You know, how how did you actually feel? Was this one of your on the crest of a wave or (laughs) at the bottom of the deep blue sea moment? Yeah, I think I went through, um, especially with the, with, with the offers, I went through a bit of a funny, I was on a bit of a downer then because I just, my, my mind just went, oh, it's not what I thought it was, not what I thought it was worth and um, oh my God, what am I going to do and um, yes, but I think with the feedback, it was it was good feedback I got, I think um, mainly good feedback. Um, 
Yeah. I mean, just just on that, Heather and Josh, is that you know that that it is you touched on it, Heather, about it's personal, it's your property. But um, you know, the best advice I can give to people is you ju- you just need to detach yourself from that, unless it's mm. unless it's particularly constructive, where the agent is saying to you, look, you should really be looking to present it this way or that way, or move this room around or whatever to get the best from the property. But sometimes the view is you know, give the most strangest feedback for, for any reason, because sometimes they don't want to offend, you know, and so you have to just some of it take it, some of it take it with a pinch of salt because um, it's not aimed at, you know, you, know, you personally. Yes. But people do get sometimes hung up on that and some people don't give feedback at all, which is frustrating, but um, they just they just never return a call and, you know, you just don't know why they didn't like it. But um mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I must admit, I think, you know, we always ask for feedback, but if somebody doesn't return our calls, it's just one of those things and it does happen. You can't take offence at it. It's just that they've probably moved on to the next property and they're feeling that stress of finding somewhere as much as you are. But, um, yeah, we like to feedback, as James said, just so that, you know, if, well, if you did this or if you did that, you know, it might just, it might not make any difference to the price or anything, but just presentation how closely have you been following the news about the housing market Josh you know how the property prices have increased the delays in searches and conveyancing how much has that actually affected your personal situation um I, I've kind of kept an eye on it just through the news and stuff and and just just knowing um just knowing personally what's going on so it hasn't really affected me at all I think I think um I knew that the uh, stamp duty was coming to end at the end of June, so I knew that I wouldn't it wouldn't affect me at all. So, it but really you were, do, do, would you feel that your interest was more heightened? You know, if you suddenly were listening yeah. to the radio and you suddenly yeah. heard oh property, and you suddenly sort of go oh I must turn the must turn the volume up a little bit there because yeah, this I'd, I'd be very, me. yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and I've been watching a lot of um, programmes on Channel Four about. <laughs> <getting on place. laughs> which I've not been bothered about normally, but oh. I'm really interested in that. It's very interesting, that. <laughs> oh, that is interesting. Oh, fantastic. Um, now, we are, I can't believe it, we're coming up to our 45 minutes because obviously uh, following this, I've got um, a discussion that I had with uh, Graham Seller, head of mortgages at Santander, which is sort of in the same line because although you're a first-time seller, Josh, you're also so a buyer, not a first time buyer, but a second time buyer. And that was a long time ago. So it it'd be interesting to hear how we get on. Um, but just pre-closing, Josh, I'm going to ask you to imagine that you wake up as the housing minister tomorrow. What would be your first three steps to simplify the process for selling your property that you would make? I think it's just been clear with with all parties um what, what's what's going on um yeah every step of the way i think having that personal personal relationship with your estate agents is 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 another important thing for me i think you did already mention about keeping everything in the right place so maybe Absolutely. yeah yes yeah that's yeah, definitely yeah mm. I mean, it must be quite difficult, you know, when you've perhaps got uh, leases and land registry titles and mortgage documents that you've just shoved in a drawer somewhere. Do do you think maybe the portals or a a platform of some shape should be able, you should be able to draw on it? That'd be a good idea, actually, very much. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, keeping everything, keeping everything in, in in a folder is great, but also having that extra, um, portal stuff would be, would be good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know we're wrapping up soon. The other thing that I'd like to say is just important really is as instructing and choosing your estate agent is mm. is really um instructing the right type of conveyancing solicitor. Um, because you know, if you can't get hold of your conveyancing solicitor throughout the transaction because either that they're they're you know, they 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 take on too much work because they're offering a cheap fee or 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 they they work out of areas you can't actually ever go and see them to look up to talk about a problem, then that could add another level of stress. So I think I ask for recommendations, not necessarily through the estate agent if you don't want to, but through friends and family and really ask that the people have the conveyances how they can make sure that, that they they're aware of your end goal as well, that they're an important cog in the wheel of this process. 
Marvellous, marvellous. That's only two, James. I need one more tip from you. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, <laughs> I would say I would be pushing for the tech uh, industry to come up with my um, suggestion I talked about earlier, which is having a transparency so people can see the progress of the chain in the transaction. So to help reduce people's anxieties about what actually is going on up and down the chain. Uh, so I'd be pushing for that type of work to happen. Marvellous. I've got another uh, one, actually, Heather. Sorry. Oh, please, please, uh, fire away. Just take a breath. <laughs> take a breath <laughs> and meditate. That's probably not a bad idea, meditate. actually. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't let it get on top of you. Yeah. I put medi- medicate on my bit of paper. <laughs> I should have said meditate, I'm shouldn't I? <laughs> I'm med- I'm medicate. <laughs> <laughs> meditate, absolutely. Well, Josh, I-, I mean, it's been fabulous talking to you as somebody who is a first-time seller, and I hope it hasn't put people off. I mean, obviously, you know, all your suggestions and uh, not to just get ahead too ahead of yourself obviously you have to be a little bit ahead of the game um but it's fascinating for us because you know sometimes we don't speak to the buyers and sellers in quite as much detail as you've been happy to share with us today so Mm. thank you very much for that and uh, (laughs) james is there anything you'd like to add just to finish off uh, no, just just to, uh, just to echo, really, I think it's really important to sort of really help people that are first-time sellers because, as you said at the very beginning of the show, we talk about a lot about first-time buyers, but they, they're, it's a completely different set of uh, circumstances you find yourself in as a first-time seller trying to balance everything. Once you've sold something once, you've sort of got a lot better understanding, but it's quite daunting. Um, so it's a good topic and more more should be spoke about more to learn from it for, for, for all parties to improve the process yeah wonderful yeah. okay so good, that good brings with you, Josh. <laughs> yeah good luck much. with your Thank move you. so Thank that you. brings that part of our show to the to a conclusion and um let's now listen to me speaking to graham seller head of mortgages at santander radio reverb making music night and day 7.2 fm Graham, good morning. Um, We're talking about first-time buyers now and coming out of lockdown and the future of UK home ownership. uh, How scary is it for first-time buyers? Well, we did a report in 2019 and it basically told us that the first-time buyers were struggling with deposits and affordability. And we've gone back and done another study in 2021 to see how the pandemic's affected uh, the first-time buyers. And actually, it's harder now to buy your first home than it was two years ago. And two years ago, it wasn't easy. We've seen house prices rise. We've seen other buyers come in, um, next-time buyers, second-time buyers, and buy to that landlords. Um, And it's proved harder for first-time buyers to buy their first home, even though they want to buy their first home even more than ever. So, yeah, very difficult, Heather. Um, A lot of first-time buyers have delayed their plans, haven't they, because of the problems that you've just um, told us about. So saving for a deposit. But if you can borrow money towards a deposit, is that going to help them get on the ladder quicker? Yeah, so what we've seen is probably a couple of years ago, about 30% of first-time buyers said deposit was the biggest barrier, whereas that number's now about 52%, over half first-time buyers are saying that's the biggest barrier. So if you can access deposit, whether that's self-saved or whether that's bank of mum and dad or or um, back of grand and granddad, obviously it's going to help. But because the house prices have gone up, you probably need slightly more deposit. Um, the, the government guarantee scheme, which launched in April, um, and Santander supports that scheme, has brought back 95% mortgages. So you can access the market um, with a 5% deposit. But clearly the rates you'll pay, et cetera, will be higher. So the bigger deposit you can save or the more money you can you can get put forward to your home, then it will make the rates lower and the affordability better for you. The problem is with I mean, I'm in this. I'm based in the southeast in Brighton. And obviously we've seen house prices absolutely rocket down here. And, you know, the stamp duty holiday in effect hasn't had. Well, I don't think it's had the effect it was meant to have, because all it's done is push prices up further with people thinking, well, actually, because I don't have to pay stamp duty now, I can afford a little bit more, making it more difficult for first time buyers to get onto that market. And you you mentioned good old mum and dad and nans and grandma. 
and granddads, aren't they brilliant? But, you know, I'm sure they have had to help out an awful lot over the past 18 months and actually make sure that they're safe themselves financially moving forward. So um, where do we go from here? You know, a lot of the younger buyers have really felt the effects of furlough, unemployment and reduced income. Is there no hope for them or, you know, all the government backed schemes um, and affordability, things that the banks can offer? Is that going to help them out of this mess, actually? Yeah, so you mentioned a couple of things there, the stamp duty concessions, which came in last July, and they're sort of tapering off now at the end of Mm. June and again at the end of September. That has helped other buyer types because first time buyers did have concessions before. So that seems to have fueled um, house price growth, as, as you've mentioned. What, what we're calling for is sort of the industry and government to work together to say, well, what is it can we do to make longer term affordability for first time buyers rather than sort of ad hoc changes? Um, and the two areas, deposits, you know, there, are, there are schemes that the government already do for, for military personnel where they lend money to sort of key workers. Uh, well, they do it for military personnel, but why can't they extend that for key workers where you can lend the, the, the first time buyer the monies for the deposit and then they end up paying that back through their, their PAYE over, over the coming years? And that might be a way for, to access deposits. But to your point about the local area, the stamp duty concession, can that not be sort of regionalised? Because clearly sometimes, you know, if the numbers are back down to 250,000, then in certain parts of the UK, that doesn't really work, doesn't really help because prices are higher than that. So it's sort of, can you regionalise that to make to make the market more accessible for first-time buyers? So there's different bits we're calling for, but there's no magic answer. Um, I probably said a couple of years ago, it's really difficult and, and it's more difficult now. So I don't want to be sitting here in two years' time saying it's even more difficult. So we do need to find some solutions for first-time buyers. Do, do you not think this is just a, a problem that never goes away? Um, I, re- I remember a long time ago when I was a first-time buyer trying to organise a deposit, and I think at the time the multiples of salaries were about 2.5 plus half of the second person's. And, in fact, I've heard some horrendous sort of eight-time salary in some areas of the uh, of the country. Um, if we're looking at affordability at perhaps 4.5 times an applicant's income, how much will it leave them for day-to-day living? Indeed, you're absolutely right. I mean, in terms of supply and demand, though, if we can find ways of bringing more property onto the market, and, you know, and traditionally we've been saying new build, build more properties, but there's definitely an opportunity to, to be able to change more uh, commercial properties into residential properties. So we know that online shopping has taken more of that market, and there must be ways of, of using existing property, which is commercial, to make that more residential. Now, the more we have properties, then clearly, hopefully, the prices would then settle or fall. Now, the, the problem in that area is it's not just about changing the, the property from being an office to a home because you need the local amenities, you need all the infrastructure. And if we do that right or, or we bring work with government and get that right, it could be we can bring more properties on, use existing buildings, et cetera, and actually bring the prices back to where they need to be to, to sort that affordability out. So the... I'm, I'm hopeful, Heather, we can find solutions. It doesn't necessarily mean it just gets worse and worse and worse. I think you're right. It has got worse over the recent past, but there must be ways of, of helping more people buy their own home. And and the other side of that, of course, is lockdown has shown us that we're all looking for places with outside space. We're looking for green spaces. I mean, when you look, when you fly in over the UK and you see all these green fields, you can't imagine that some places don't actually have a little backyard with a piece of lawn on it, don't you? But, um, you know, it's all very well uh, converting commercial uh, properties into residential but equally the people who reside there will be wanting their own little balconies or their own little communal area to sort of go and the roof terraces maybe is that possible with converting commercial um, property yeah you're absolutely right I mean what the study shows as well is that more people want to own their own home but you've got these sort of virtual commuter belts where people want to live a little bit more outside town centres and like you say, have a card and have somewhere to work, et cetera, with, with the way the world's changed. And you can't make properties for customers unless, unless that's what they want. So it, they may need more conversions, but I think you're absolutely right. The whole It's got to be thought through. You can't just change an office into four flats because that won't lead to you know good living over the years to come. You need gardens, you need open spaces, and you need the amenities in the local area. But that's just one of the things we, we think we should discuss more 
rather than some of the sort of blunt tools we've used recently, stamp duty, et cetera, which does cause more properties to be sold, but it has caused more, more house price inflation, which doesn't really help in, in, in the rounds. So the first time buyers that you spoke to during the course of this survey, what exactly were they telling you apart from the monetary side of buying a property? What were they telling you in terms of the facilities that they wanted within their properties? Did they say, you know, I'd be very happy with a one bedroom as long as I've got a, you know, a a nice size lounge kitchen, as long as I've got a little bit of outside space? What is it they want for their money? Well, I think what they want is they want to own their own home. That's what's come through on the survey. So 63% of people say it's now more important to own my own home than before the pandemic. Um, But I think people want somewhere to work at home. That's the thing it's come through on the survey is that, you know, whereas home working was something we might do once in a while, it seems to be something people want to plan for more. So an office at home is probably more important than the garden. But a garden it also comes through very strongly. So it's, it's the standard stuff, Heather. It's people want mm-hmm. space and they want somewhere to be able to work um, at home and, and not be overrun because there's not enough room, I suppose. They're the two bits that come out. Yeah. The problem with that is the more space you need, the more the property costs and then the affordability and the deposit um, aspect comes back in. But yeah, certainly first time buyers want somewhere to work, somewhere to have um, a garden. And, and, and that's what, the, what it's saying in, in bigger numbers than before. So can you, just to finish off, Graham, just explain what Santander can do to support first-time buyers? Yeah, of course. I mean, we, as I said before, we're in the mortgage guarantee scheme, so we're open for 5% deposit mortgages. We're very happy to accept bank of mum and dad, grand and granddad gritted deposits. You've got terms up to 40 years, which which makes mortgages more affordable, etc. Um, but I would urge the listeners to come onto our website. We've got some fantastic new tools on there. Um, if you go to the local area, it tells you how much the property prices are, how much deposit you need to save, and then you put down how much you can save, and it tells you how long it will take you. And if you have got mum and dad or grand and granddad, you can also add that into the equation to show you how that can save time, etc. So come on the website, look at all the first-time buyer sections, and, and educate yourself because it's the biggest financial commitment you're probably ever going to make. Um, I mean, you should always take the time to make sure you make the right decisions. Absolutely. And it's not an overnight decision either, is it? So you need to start planning this well in advance. Absolutely. And, you know, and it, it's, it's more important to make the right decision than a quick decision, definitely. Fantastic. So I really, I really love the work that's been done on this. And I think, you know, we need to give our young people the best start in life as possible. And obviously, owning your own home gives you a great sense of self worth. And it gives you a great sense of, you know, let's go out and move up that ladder and get to where we want to go. And and it's great to think that the government and, you know, banks and building societies are helping to achieve that. So thank you so much for talking to me today, Graham. I think you've probably got a busy time ahead of you. (laughs) as we come out of lockdown it's been a pleasure thank you very much for your time as well thank you cheers bye-bye bye my hour has come to an end i do hope you've enjoyed listening to all my guests i'll be back again next month with more interviews if you work in property or have a specific interest in property and would like to appear on the program contact me via instagram or facebook and i'd be delighted to hear from you Really, anything local is of interest, including architecture, surveying, interior design, gardening. You know, we love everything property, obviously. So please get in touch. Thank you for listening today. I hope you've enjoyed the show as much as I have. Bye for now from Let's Talk Property on Radio Reverb, 97.2 FM and DAB.